Experts from the Endocrine Society were taken by surprise earlier this year when the U.S. Food and Drug Administration declared the chemical bisphenol A safe for consumers. Better known as BPA, the chemical sometimes added to plastics and has been found to interfere with human hormones. Laura Vandenberg, an associate professor with the University of Massachusetts Amherst School of Public Health and Health Sciences, was among those people who was surprised. She points out that the FDA even dismissed its own data, showing that low levels of BPA could increase the risk of breast and prostate cancer. I spoke with her in the studio about that and more. I started in my graduate training um, almost 15 years ago because of my interest in endocrinology, so hormones, and developmental biology. And getting involved in endocrine disruptor research really is trying to understand how chemicals that can affect how hormones act in our body can induce diseases in our body. So I'm interested in breast development, breast cancer, lactation, how mom interacts with her babies, um, things like infertility. Um, and we've been finding in the lab that endocrine disruptors can cause these kinds of effects, particularly in rodents. And so among those endocrine disruptors that you're taking a look at, BPA is one of them, right? So bisphenol A, this additive in plastic, um, is on that list, right? That's right, yeah. BPA got a lot of attention at, for really the last 20 years because it's a chemical that in our bodies can mimic estrogen, the female hormone. And so what problems can that cause then? Yeah, so estrogen is important in development, so to uh, make your brain normal, to allow your reproductive organs to develop normally, and estrogen also plays a role in a lot of diseases. So estrogen is um, implicated in breast cancer in women. Uh, abnormal estrogen could play a role in infertility. So um, the, the, that what that suggests is that BPA could be affecting things like normal development, but also promoting disease. Because people are getting getting exposed to BPA and then maybe bumping up the estrogen, either through having exposure to it in a plastic water bottle or heating up their food in plastic, or even thermal paper receipts that you get at the grocery store or tens of thousands of other places? Yeah, so our exposures to BPA come from a lot of different sources. Um, and it, BPA starts to be used in new consumer products, and we don't really know until a scientist sort of figures out that that's where it is. So we know that it's in can linings for food and beverage um, containers, a lot of plastics, especially hard, rigid plastics, the kind that aren't meant to be used once and thrown away. Um, thermal paper, as you noted, um, BPA is sort of sprayed almost like baby powder right on the surface of that thermal paper. So when we handle it, it um, can enter, uh, really be left so on our skin. it actually rubs off yeah. on your skin and you can absorb it that way? Yeah, if you've ever seen them, um, uh, sometimes if you go to a, a restaurant and the, and the server um, sort of circles your what to do, what, what's do with their finger, and it, it can turn black. Yeah. Um, that's the role of BPA on thermal paper is to change color when heat is applied to it. And so it comes right off those thermal papers when we handle them um, normally. And, and there is some research that suggests that if you're using um, things like um, hand sanitizers, it can increase your absorption of BPA because a lot of personal care products can poke teeny tiny little holes in your cells, which will increase the uptake of that chemical. Wow. So BPA has been in the news again recently because recently the Food and Drug Administration came out and said that it declared the chemical BPA safe for consumers while at the same time there's this study going on that's actually looking at whether or not BPA is safe, right? Yeah. So when the FDA came out and said that preliminarily they think it's safe, what did you think? Well, there's two two immediate responses. One is that there are more than 100 studies that have been done in humans that suggest that people who have more BPA in their body are at increased risk for diseases. Um, these are things like ADHD in children, uh, obesity in both children and in adults, and infertility. So uh, those 100 studies suggest that this isn't something that we should take lightly, that this is a chemical that does seem to be having effects on people like you and me who are just exposed from everyday living. Um, the other thing is that, as you point out, there's this new study. It's called Clarity, and it was supposed to bring 
bring clarity to whether BPA is <laughs> is, <laughs> is safe or not. And and really what clarity was going to do is to do what's traditionally done when we test chemicals for toxicity, which is look to see, you know, do the animals live if they're exposed? Uh, do they have changes in the weight of their uterus or the weight of their brain? Well, those are good ways to tell you if a chemical is toxic, will it kill you? But Clarity was supposed to not just look at those kind of endpoints, but also things like abnormal behaviors in rodents, abnormal fertility, abnormal mammary gland development. So FDA saying that it's safe, they were only looking at that first set of data, that BPA doesn't outright kill animals. Well, we already knew that, right? So you and I have been exposed to it. None of us are dying from touching a thermal paper, thermal receipt paper. But whether it's contributing to disease, we need the rest of the study in order to draw that conclusion. And so why do you think that FDA came out with having kind of part A, but not part B, and made that sort of preliminary finding? Yeah, so the, the data that was in that part A is what regulatory agencies like FDA are used to looking at. So they're used to looking at, does this chemical kill? Or does this chemical maim? But you and I are not being killed from our use of personal care products or um, you know things that we spray in our houses. If those chemicals are contributing to disease, it's a long, slow progression. And so does FDA ever look at that long? Long, slow progression or the cumulative you know the uh, cumulative impact on the body no is the, really the answer uh, there aren't really good methods to look at long-term effects um, of environmental chemicals we rarely look at more than one chemical at a time so most studies that have been done uh, on BPA or really any other chemical look at one chemical at a time so there's a lot that we're missing by the way that we've set up chemical safety evaluations and so with this research that's going on, the Part B that will be available, do we know when that portion of the study will be concluded? Yeah, those are studies that are actually being done by, um, there's 13 academic participants, and they're already being published. They're sort of being rolled out as the academics finish their analyses. Um, so to my knowledge, there's more than 10 papers that have already come out of Part B and more to come. When we look at those papers, they don't suggest that BPA is safe. And so what do you suggest that we do with this information now? If FDA isn't looking at that cumulative information, is it time for the FDA to sort of pivot the way it looks at this thing? I think clarity, you know, the whole point was to help FDA pivot, as you say. It was to provide evidence where we could say, okay, if, if design A, where we weigh organs, isn't good enough anymore, and it isn't predictive of the kinds of diseases that we're seeing in children like asthma and ADHD and autism, or diseases that are increasing in the population like breast cancer. If A isn't good enough, is B good enough? And so I, I still have hope that with the completion of the clarity study, we'll be able to answer that. Um, so I think Yes, FDA does need to pivot, um, but I also think that um, people have already pivoted. So, you know. You see BPA free in a lot of things. Yeah, and so I think that consumers have become much more savvy and thoughtful about, um, about what they buy. Um, I, I would note, though, that a lot of things that are labeled BPA free have BPA replacement chemicals like BPS, BPAF, BPF. These are chemically very similar compounds, and they're very poorly studied. And, and there is some evidence uh, from my lab and others that suggest that they could cause harm. So briefly, are there things that people can do to protect themselves if the products do contain those other chemicals? Yeah, so I, I mean, I generally uh, like to say, you know, is this something you really need? So a lot of um, the students on, on the UMass campus have shifted to reusable water bottles. And that's great, right? We're reducing waste. Um, and, and you know, if you're going to use something for a long period of time, like a reusable water bottle, buy the safest one that's possible. So, you know, can you buy a stainless steel? Can you buy a glass bottle? They even, you know, will There's wrap like them in things. Coating, yeah, yeah, there's there's really been a lot of um, sustainable responses to try to avoid chemicals. Um, but I also think that we should not leave it up to the everyday consumer, right? Are you a chemist? Probably not, right? I'm not Definitely a chemist. Not. No, <laughs> so we shouldn't be required to be chemists to go to the grocery store and make decisions for ourselves. So what that means is that we as, as citizens, as consumers, have to push companies and regulatory agencies to do better.